Good morning. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome each of you here this morning. Uh, one thing I observed that uh, everybody got quiet for probably a moment, and it's really rewarding to see quietness. <laughs> so uh, whatever we do in our daily life or work, it's always good to have a moment of uh, peace within yourself, if not with other people. That having been said, uh, I call the meeting to order. Let's have our roll call, please. Thank you, Dave. Now let's uh, stand, and Mr. Garish will have our pledge, uh, have our invocation, and Mr. James will have our pledge. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your many blessings upon us. We thank you for the opportunity we have of gathering together here in this place as a community. We thank you, Father, for each one that is here. We pray that you might, might bless each one, bless all of the citizens of our great county. Father, we pray that you might be with each one of us as board members this morning, that you might be with us as we deliberate the various issues. Help us, Father, to make those decisions that are pleasing in your sight and those decisions that are best for the community we represent. These blessings we pray in your holy name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Are there any corrections or additions to the agenda? Well, I have to approve. I have Second. an addition, Mr. Well, Chairman. Just, just a minute. All right, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Lee. Judge Duke asked me to bring this forward. I'd like to add it under uh, items for decisions, just reference to hanging the portrait in the uh, Superior Court room. If we can add that under items for decision, I think the manager has some information he'll pass out on it. All right. Thank you. Now, any other corrections or additions? If not, now we have a motion. Motion for approval. Second. All right, let's vote. Okay, Mr. Rhodes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, we have two public hearings for your consideration this morning. Uh, these two public hearings are related to our 2012 uh, Community Development Block Grant application. And this, of course, is a scattered site application that will be working to rehabilitate or actually replace about three homes throughout the county. Um, these two final public hearings will be the ones that will remove the remaining outstanding funding conditions for our uh, uh, receipt, receipt of these funds. And the purpose of the first hearing today is to allow citizens an opportunity to express their views concerning our overall community development needs in the county. Uh, this particular program is designed for low-income income home occupants and is based on the severity, severity of the needs. We go out and do assessments on the homes that, uh, of the folks that come in and apply for these funds. Uh, we have had success in the past. Uh, the funding levels have come down substantially. We used to get about $400 or more thousand dollars per uh, cycle. Now we're down to $225. Uh, the last cycle in 2009, we were able to rehabilitate nine structures. Just as some examples, uh, this is a home uh, in the Aden area that we've been able to do some uh, work on the roof as well as some other things on the interior with the kitchen. And we do a lot of uh, work in the bathrooms of the house, a lot of times to make them handicap accessible. Um, these funds, of course, are ministered through the Department of Commerce for North Carolina, and it is to repair or replace substantial housings, uh, housing for low-income households. Uh, this particular one, we may recall, we actually came back to you in July of last year, and we actually, where we used to do replacement housing with Grifton Mission Ministries, uh, since that uh, group is no longer active in that particular area, we're actually seeking to use these funds for modular housing. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, we're recommending that you hold the public <coughs> hearing to hear uh, any public comments about this program. Thank you, sir. We now declare the public hearing open. Uh, Gina, want to sign up to speak for that, Mr. Manager? No, sir, we do not. All right. 
Uh, is there anyone present that did not sign that desires to speak to the issue that's spoken about uh, Mr. Rhodes? If not, then I declare the public hearing closed. What's the pleasure of the board? I make a motion that we accept this recommendation for the CDBG second. application. Right. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. We, we've 200. got a motion made and second. Now we've got discussion, Mr. James. All right. Out of the 225000 how much money do we have to uh, donate it with that, or is that all a grant? That's all a grant. So we do, Pitt County does not have to No match at all in this grant. That's good. <clears throat> Anybody else? Uh, uh, again, Melvin? What is uh, considered low income in terms of? Uh, it's based on the median income in this particular grant. Uh, I believe it's anything below 80% of the median household income in uh, Pitt County. So it's specific to <coughs> Pitt County. And it, of course, varies based on the number of people in the household. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, ready to vote. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rhodes. And similarly, we have a second public hearing that's also required for these funds, and this is uh, actually for this grant application itself and an explanation of eligible activities and program requirements. Um, with our grant, um, it does not actually, um, their jurisdictional requirements since the city of Greenville is an entitlement area and they receive fundings through another um, process our funds our scattered site funds are allowed to be used in any other area outside the city limits of the city of Greenville so when applicants come through we do make sure that they uh, reside outside the city limits of Greenville cannot be within a floodplain area and the applicants must uh, reside in their home full-time and of course they need to be the actual owner of the home we've had issues in the past with um, air property uh, or in cases where folks might have um, some authority to live in a home throughout the remainder of their life, in this case, they have to be the outright owners of the homes. Uh, also, there are income requirements, and they uh, <coughs> anyone that wishes to uh, apply for these funds must also attend one of our annual information sessions. Uh, the anticipated funding amount, and we've received uh, approval of this already, is $225,000, and it is for replacement housing. And with that, you can see, again, as I've mentioned in past, we have done some replacement housing with Grifton Mission Ministries, uh, which were site-built homes on the right. Uh, this time, we'll be looking at modular homes being brought in. And again, our second public hearing is now ready to be held. Uh, we, I declare the public hearing open. Anyone signed for that, Mr. Manager? Uh, no, sir. Are there anyone, or is there anyone present that desires to speak to that issue? If not, I declare the public hearing closed. What's the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Elliott. Okay, next on the agenda, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, we have the Employee Service Awards. Mr. Chairman, if we'll get down front. Okay. for their tenure with our organization and will be recognized employees in a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30-year 30 30 year categories. Occasionally we do have a 35-year employee, but not this morning. So as we call your name up in the, the categories of years, if the audience will hold your applause till the end, um, then we'll recognize at the very end. So recognizing five-year service awards for April of 2014, Stephen Branch with the Emergency Management, Next, Tasha Keisha Brown, Detention Center. Shannon Carter, Social Services. Well, okay. <laughs> Randall Cox, Sheriff's Office. All right. 
<clears throat> Catherine Crisp, Social Services. Barbara Guthrie, Social Services. <clears throat> Natalie Harris, Public Health. Next one is not here, but we're going to recognize them. John Page, Detention Center. Actually, I think um, it's maybe Natalie Harris, okay? Congratulations. <laughs> April Phelps, Emergency Management. And our last five years, Tamika Sneed, Detention Center. Okay, if we can have applause, please. All right, moving into tenure category, Donald Buck, Detention Center. <clears throat> Christina Carter, Social Services. Crystal Diaz, Social Services. Sharon Edwards, Social Services. Ronald Fair the Third, Detention Center. Brett Faust, Sheriff's Office. Jennifer Fowler, Social Services. <coughs> Timothy Hines, Detention Center. Nancy Hewer, Social Services. Noel Lee III, Emergency Management. And our last 10 years to Randy Newsom, Sheriff's Office. Okay. Moving to 15 years, our first one is Dolly Bryant Dawson, Juvenile Services. <laughs> Stephen Cody, Communications, 911. Patricia Daniels, Social Services. Justin Dickinson, Sheriff's Office. Marie Gonzalez, Social Services. Uh, 
Shonda Pittman, Human Resources. Our last 15 year is David Whitley, Sheriff's Office. Okay, applause please. Moving to 20 years, we have four employees we're recognizing this morning. Michael Carmen, Detention Center. And at 20 years, um, the wrapped box with silver wrapping paper is a watch the employees are um, pick out as their honor of being with Pitt County for 20 years. Congratulations. Gail Everett, Finance Department, formerly Mental Health. Nancy Wilson, Legal Department. Yes, I do. Thank you. Let's get right to it. Thank you. And our last 20 year is Cynthia Hicks, Detention Center. All right. In our 25-year category, we have two employees this morning. First one is Michelle Newkirk, Public Health. Again, 25 years. And our second 25-year recognition is to Nancy Stone, Public Health. She's not here this morning. And this morning we recognized one 30-year employee within the Department of Social Services, Margaret Dixon. Yes, there's a reception for the employees and the, anybody else who would like to come if you would enter through the door here on the left and then just make a, a roundabout coming out. And um, I think the board will probably break for a few minutes for that. Come on back and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you. We are now back in session uh, after having uh, honored our employees that received special awards this morning. Mr. Manson, next. Order business. Yes, sir. We have public addresses to the board, and there are three people signed up this morning. And if you'll come up, the attorney will, as we're calling you up, will read the guidelines for public addresses. But first, we have Beth Sanchez. And as we say each time, Mr. Chairman, Pitt County welcomes um, all comments on matters of public concern. <coughs> I will keep your time to three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm speaking to you this morning as a citizen, maybe for the last time. If passed, the Canine Control Ordinance, drafted by county staff, will now give the authority of Animal Control and the Sheriff's Department to assist citizens who call for help regarding roaming dogs, which are threatening them or creating nuisances on their properties or on public spaces. Citizens will simply be required to maintain their dogs on their properties and to maintain physical control of them when off their property. This will ensure the safety not only of people, but of animals. A serious outcome of a roaming dog is a dog attack on a person, a pet, or livestock. After the February, at the February joint meeting of the Animal Board and Commissioners, Dr. Willis, the veterinarian representative, provided each of you with a copy of the document, A Community Approach to Dog Bite Prevention, written by the American Veterinarian Medical Association Task Force on Canine Aggression. Four preventative measures are listed. The first is the control of unrestrained and free roaming animals. This ordinance addresses this issue with dogs. The second and third measures are dog licensing and vaccinations. Licensing dogs, which is being explored by the county staff, but not part of this ordinance, will allow for the quick identification of dogs if they are lost or picked up. 
assist with funding the services provided by animal control, and vaccinations are already being addressed by the county. And lastly, the association does not believe breed-specific bans to be appropriate or effective, and this ordinance is not breed-specific. For the ordinance to be effective, it must be enforced and funded. At a bare minimum, for the short term, far less than the one $2. million dollars. Utilize the current facility, including the entire backside of the kennels. Add two more animal control officers and have all officers appropriately equipped working out in the field and not cleaning the shelters. The shelter needs to have a sufficient number of shelter attendants in order to provide the necessary care and treatment for the animals and for the safety of the staff, its volunteers, and its visitors. An administrative assistant is needed not only to assist Ms. Whaley with her duties, but to answer phone calls from citizens from eight to five. To protect pets who were lost, a centralized lost and found pet, lost and found pet website developed by county staff will be a low cost, effective tool for staff to be able to locate and reunite a dog back to its owner. I believe today is the day, it's now, that I hand over the canine control ordinance to the Board of Commissioners. How will you direct animal control to answer the phone? How do you envision Pitt County Animal Control Services after June 30th? Can a group of friends walk around the block without sticks? Can you ride a bike or run with your dog on a leash without being chased? Can you get in and out of your house or your That's car without wondering if the dog in your yard is friendly or not? That is my expectation and hope. Or will the 12-year-old boy who stood so bravely before you in February have to continue to weave between houses in his neighborhood trying to dodge dogs just to get to the <coughs> bus stop to go to school? I hope not. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next. Next, we have Brenda Harris. I'm Brenda Harris. My address is on file. I laughingly told one of your sheriffs that when I break this to illustrate, I wasn't going to use it on anybody. What I want to bring before you, I could talk to you about the inspections department, but I have a packet that I'm going to ask your very ballot um, secretary to get to each one of you. Um, it shows that we have diligently tried to take possession of the property at 1383 Frankie Coburn Road. And this is a criminal warrant that I was accused one day after I filed and the eviction was served. Obviously, it didn't get served. But the real issue that I want to talk to you about today is the permit. You accused me of not buying a permit when in essentially William Civils was the one that did not buy the permit and built the addition. But I want to bring you something before you that's been on somewhat on the news this week. It's our representative, Brian Brown. It appears that he not only cannot calculate his campaign finance reports, but at 412 Knoll Court, our Harbor subdivision, he built an illegal addition. He didn't buy a permit. This represents the rules that we have to play by. Some of them are general statutes under city jurisdiction. Some of them are 153A under county jurisdiction. But all of them are the laws of our state. Then we have the North Carolina Constitution. Then we have the ordinances that require us to, to buy permits. But when you take a rule and you bend it, depending on who it belongs to, it's no longer a rule. You can no longer put it back together. So what I'm saying is, if Brenda Harris is going to tear an addition down because she didn't buy a permit when it wasn't really her, then why don't you use that same yardstick, that rule, for Mr. Brown? And whether it be the city jurisdiction or the county, Mr. Chairman, I just delivered you a letter. And that letter cites a formal complaint. According to the Department of Insurance, this county is regulated by formal complaints. I make a formal complaint that if I'm required to buy a permit, and that is the rule, then by God, Mr. Brian Brown is required to play by that same rule. My information is, is that it was a sunroom. It was approximately probably a 14, 16 by 20, and it was built under Sly. So I want you to report it to our tax department because God help, they need the money. And it looks like that would be an impropriety on the taxes, too. 
when you have a state representative that pledges itself to the state of North Carolina and is willfully breaking the law, then we not only have a campaign finance problem, but we have a citizen problem on who you trust. And while this is a vote situation, I want to know that the representatives that represent Brenda Harris and the citizens of this good community. Wrap it up, Ms. Harris. I certainly am. Thank you. Let the, the, the issue today is what kind of rules are you playing by? Broken ones or the full deck? Thank God you, ma'am. You. Thank you, ma'am. Who's next? Next, we have Linda Mazur. <clears throat> I'm Linda Mazur, and I'm the current chairman of the Animal Control Advisory Board, and I just wanted to give you a very brief update. Uh, I know it's on your agenda today, but I did want to let you know that the language of the ordinance that's coming in today, that when it was put to a vote with the Animal Control Advisory Board, that was a unanimous decision, and also the funding was a unanimous decision as well, coming in on that information. And it's very important that as you <coughs> consider this ordinance and if you pass this ordinance to please fund the ordinance appropriately and if you can't do that then fall back on the strategic plan thank you thank you ma'am all right mr. manager okay next under items to report the first item we have a report from the Pitt County School Superintendent dr. Ethan Linker if he is here yet he should be here in just a second. all right okay. let's move on to the next one no rush okay Item number two is a report from our tax administration department um, on the tax and tag together um, program that went into effect this fiscal year. Teresa Elks is going to provide this presentation on behalf of the department. Good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to give a brief update on the new tag and tax system. Um, this system changed and uh, with the September 2013 renewals when you go renew <coughs> At that time, you pay your tax as well as your renewal fees. Um, <coughs> the chart that you see here is a comparison report from what we've been collecting from BTS for the first six months. And BTS is the new vehicle tax system from the Department of Revenue and Department of Transportation versus what we've been collecting from our old billing system in NCPTS. And as you can see from the chart, the monies that we're collecting from BTS are gradually going up as our monies from the old system are gradually going down, and this is what we expect to see. Um, it was a slow start with this because a lot of the, it, it was confusing to a lot of taxpayers, but I think once everybody goes through this first renewal system, I think it's going to pick up. Normally, April, May, and June are the busiest renewal months, so the state expects the um, low renewal rate to pick up at this point in time. Any questions? If not, uh, we received the report, and thank you, ma'am. All right, what's next, Mr. Mayor? Okay, I think we just saw Dr. Linker come in, if you'd like to have him come Fine, forward. Dr. Linker. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to share some things that are going on in the school system and some advancements we're, uh, we're working on and where we're trying to go in the future. <coughs> Which one, Brock? All right. Just some highlights of some things. Um, last year's test data came out, and if you actually looked at the data, you would say, well, test scores were way down, but that was obviously because of, of the new test, the new curriculum, and everything else. But when you look across the state, you can see that uh, the Pitt County Schools teachers are, uh, as far as growth-wise, are meeting growth at uh, a little bit better than the state average. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're proud of, that our teachers are performing where they need to be performing. Obviously, we want to get everyone there. But you can kind of see, um, compared to the state, our teachers are, are top-notch. Is that questions? Is that OK? Um, curriculum issues or curriculum changes coming down the road. Um, this year we've um, written several grants. The uh, digital uh, learning grants are ones we just completed. It was about $250,000 worth of grants we've received. And that is designed to, um, uh, to really just to, to bring out uh, some new math classes and some science classes, really online resources for those classes. 
Um, we also received a STEM grant. I think we announced that at our board meeting last month, but that STEM grant is going to put in a, a lab at one of our middle schools. And what that'll do is change the focus of the CTE classes in middle schools to where it's more of a hands-on approach to what's really going on in the world today. That could include everything from robotics to, to uh, uh, agriculture to uh, motion to forces. Uh, several of us visited some schools in Craven County last week and saw some really neat stuff that the kids are going to be able to do. Um, to tie along with the STEM grant that we've already received, we've been working with East Carolina and Pitt Community College on a, and Golden Leaf on a grant that we are hoping that comes through for us. And that grant will allow these STEM labs to go through all of our middle schools and our K-8 schools to put this in all of the schools, actually K-8, in all the eighth grade <coughs> classes around the county. Uh, that, of course, will be a two-year project to get that implemented. If, um, if all this comes through, we hope to even to uh, expand to have maybe two or three STEM labs in place in the fall, in a couple months. The plan will be working with STEM East and get some, the businesses together to help us decide what we want to teach. And we can teach, you know, we have probably 50 or 60 different curriculum options, but we really want the, the businesses and the industry and the community to help us decide what they need. So when we teach it in the eighth grade, those kids can then move through high school and, um, and use those skills as they move forward, then they'll be ready for the work world. So that's, that's the goal of that. Um, Pitt County Schools Virtual Academy is a, a new process coming to Pitt, uh, Pitt County where, where kids are just going to have the option to have a lot more online classes. Um, just their own virtual academy. You've heard the state talk about the virtual academy, and you hear a lot of online schools. We do use the North Carolina Virtual High School, but this will actually be one run by us, run by Pitt County Schools. Several options give kids more of an opportunity to, to work in their schedules, but also give teachers the chance to make some extra money as well. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Kids get more options. Uh, teachers can make some money. Um, and then allow kids to move through the, the curriculum. Uh, that will start this fall. We're in the process of building that now. Uh, the expansion of CTE programs, a lot of nice stuff going on there. Uh, the fireman's certification class is expanding. Uh, ag science and ag mechanics is expanding. We're offering those classes at our schools. Uh, we're also increased welding and electronics in our high school. So there are options for these kids. <coughs> One of the things that the electronics classes, I believe, is going to be taught by Pitt Community College. Oh, there they are. Uh, Pitt Community College will go on to our campus and teach these classes. Our relationship with Pitt Community College is, I can't say enough about uh, uh, Dr. Massey and what, working with him and what they're doing to help expand our options and uh, offering to even come on our campuses and teach. That's just, that's good stuff. And it's just a great relationship we have there. A uh, couple things coming down. You've probably already heard about the dual language uh, immersion program we're talking about, at putting at Belvoir, where we're going to take, um, try to teach a class in both Spanish and English. That'll kind of be of a, a lottery choice, but that dual immersion class will start in kindergarten, not this fall, but the following fall. And that'll actually be open countywide. That, there's a lot of uh, research on that that'll show that those kids going through that program just really excel through th third, fourth, fifth grade in their reading comprehension. Um, to help make our kids more of a dual language uh, uh, children, where they, you know, instead of getting, you know, like uh, most kids get two classes in high school, our kids will get it from kindergarten all the way through. Uh, they'll truly be bilingual, which is what we need. Um, uh, again, I've talked about the partnership with Pitt Community College. We're doing a lot, lot there. Uh, we're also going to look at our middle school STEM school. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is taking or figuring out a way to take middle school and make more of a magnet type of approach with the STEM focus at the middle school or at a middle school and allow that, uh, again, a kind of a lottery or a magnet school approach and then follow that through high school so these kids have uh, the options for the science, math, technology, engineering focus. Um, and if you really think about STEM, you know, STEM, you know, we all know that it stands for the science, technology, engineering, and, and math, but if you really look at it, it's really just a different way to teach. It's really just about, you know, I like to call it strategies that engage the mind. That's really what it's about, about hands-on, about uh, project-based learning, not so much uh, sit and get type of stuff, but a lot of, um, a lot of kids getting involved in what they're trying to do. Some uh, recruitment things. Um, recruitment and retention, I think we have shared with you that our, our teacher turnover rate last year was 18%, which is 
which is uh, way too high for, for Pitt County schools, way too high for anybody. Um, you know, we have the sign-on bonus uh, this year for all of our teachers. We're actually implementing next year $2,500 uh, $2, signing bonus uh, for math and science and EC teachers. Recruiting those three subjects has become um, uh, a challenge for every school district. And uh, here in Pitt County, we obviously need the best teachers, and we're going to go get the best and bring them here into our schools. So we'll be able to work on that. Um, of course, this year we also reinstated our uh, beginning teacher sub, uh, supplements, and that's because of the help from uh, the county commissioners. We certainly appreciate the support there so we can keep teachers coming into Pitt County. More um, uh, recruitment and retention issues. One, the um, increase in teacher supplements for all teachers. This is something that uh, Mr. Elliott and I will be discussing, we'll be bringing to you that our board is, is working through, but we would like to increase our supplements from 5 to 6% uh, countywide and also a 1% supplement for all the teachers, specifically in the high need schools, the hard to, hard to um, the unitary schools and the hard to fill schools. And uh, to make this happen, we certainly need the county commissioner's support as we move forward with this discussion. Uh, we recently had a, uh, a survey done, a security test. Uh, we contracted with a group to come in and go through all of our buildings, all of our schools, maintenance building, the whole place see what issues we have and where we need to focus. These are a couple of things that we are uh, looking at doing now. You can see we're, we're uh, re revising our complete crisis uh, plans, our panic buttons. Uh, we'll have all those installed by the time school starts. Uh, front door buzz-in systems by December at the elementary and <coughs> middle school levels. Um, we are increasing our cameras at the middle school and high schools. We'll start there and work our way down. And then we're still working on some of our open schools, our open campus schools, specifically like Elmhurst and Walcoats, um, South Greenville. How do we secure those and make them as secure as we can get them? So those are things we're still working on. This, I know you can't read that. Did you have a hard copy? Uh, do we have a hard copy? We'll get you one if you want to. That's just a, we just had a, uh, a growth analysis, a survey done of where our schools are going to look like over the next 10 years, um, we use it for about three years worth of growth and kind of monitor that. You can see the um, lot of red and orange in there. Those are schools that are, that are over capacity. So we're going to use this data. I just shared that with you. So you can see that we're not just making these numbers up. Um, but we'll use those um, to help us decide our long-term long uh, facility needs in Pitt County schools and help us, you know, just some things we need to prioritize our, our capital um, our capital needs. Um, there are some items listed there. Finish some renovations at Chicago, some renovation plans. Um, we need to start looking at, at AG Cox, roof repair, roof repairs, things of that nature. Those are items that um, were on the list, um, I think, a couple years ago when the board went through their facilities analysis, my board, Board of Education. And as uh, we continue this process over, over the next several months, we will bring that uh, list to the county commissioners. Technology initiatives, you know, technology has kind of changed the world. The Internet has really changed what we do in education as much as anything that's probably ever happened. Um, we've got uh, online testing. We're talking about STEM. Digital learning is, is through the roof. Uh, virtual academy. All the changes we're putting in place uh, obviously made us make a few changes as well. Uh, one, we've doubled our bandwidth in-house so we can handle in-house. We can handle everything we need to deal with. We still have trouble connecting to Raleigh. But that's something the state's working on. Um, uh, our wireless access points, you know, we've rolled out, uh, I think last year, 8,000 Chromebooks. We roll, won't roll out near that many this year, but we will roll out some. So we need to keep working our access points so all the uh, laptops can connect to the Internet. Um, continue upgrading everything, as well as um, just the monitoring and filter systems that go along with E-Rate to make sure we're staying in compliance with, those, uh, with the technology there. Uh, some communications things, uh, Brock uh, uh, Letchworth, you see the magazine Inspire. Uh, you can see what's going on. We put this together, or actually Brock put this together about a month ago. Um, it's just, just a good, eye, good picture, a snapshot of what's going on in our schools. You know, one of the things I heard lots of times is, uh, since I've been here is Pitt County Schools doesn't have STEM. Well, I looked around and, and every single one of our schools teaches science, technology, engineering, and math at every level. You can go into kindergarten levels and see it high school levels and see it, middle schools and see it. 
Um, so we wanted to make sure everyone could see what was going on in, in Pitt County schools. That's one of the focuses that I've had since I've got here is to, to get people into the schools, walk around, see what's, uh, what's happening. Um, so that gives you a picture of what's going on there. And we also have our new app that just came out last week. And I don't know how to connect to that, but if you uh, have your smartphone, you can pull it out and, and get the information. I had it right here. Of course, it closed. But um, there it is, the app right there. You get it on any of your phones or your iPads. You'll get the updates for school closings. You'll get the, the news updates, what's going on. You can contact your schools. It's got a link to the parent portal. I do two clicks. I got my kids' grades for the, sometimes for the day. You know, it's really upsetting to the kids when they get home and already know what they got on their, uh, their assignment, you know. So that's really good stuff for parents to be able to keep track of their kids and what's going on. I mean, I don't need report cards anymore. Uh, in fact, I don't need to ask my kids for report cards anymore because I can see it, you know, before it even comes out. And not me, everybody can see it. So we have that information. So a lot of nice things happening here in Pitt County Schools uh, as far as the kids um, and uh, you know, parents. You know, we're working with the Parents for Public Schools of Pitt County to get all this information out. Uh, had lunch last week and some, some uh, people was having lunch with, they had already downloaded the app and they were able to keep track of their kids. You know, so it's, it's really nice to be able to see what we're doing. Gentlemen, ladies. Please, anything else you want to add? Uh, I, I would say about the magazine that we passed out to you, we distributed those to local businesses and uh, realtors. Um, Biden got about 1,000 copies. They're using that with employee recruitment and that type of thing. Um, that was one of the main reasons we developed that magazine was so they would have something to hand out to, <coughs> folks, uh, to try to bring people into Pitt County. One of the things they always ask about are the schools. Well, now they've got something that they can look at and peruse and learn more about them. Anything else? Questions? Dr. Lincoln, yes, um, I know you, last time you paid a visit to us here, you, you came along with, with one legal pad in your hand. I see you came in force today <laughs> with your factual and information, but uh, be that, how about turn and introduce all so everybody, sure. we probably know everybody, but <laughs> let us know who you have with you. Certainly. Uh, Cheryl. This is Cheryl Olmstead, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction. Uh, Matt Johnson. Uh, Executive Director of Facilities, Michael Cowan, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Finance, and Brock Letchworth, uh, Public Information Officer. All right, we've had a very informative review, and uh, Dr. Johnson, I believe you want to ask the question, then Mr. James. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I, I just simply wanted to point out that uh, as a liaison between this Board of Commissioners and the School Board, that uh, Dr. Linker did bring several of his staff members with him today. And uh, if you're interested in more details about what's happening uh, in the schools tonight on the third floor, uh, the school board will be meeting. And uh, I'll be there and I hope that uh, Several of you folks will be available at the school board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, sir. Mr. James? I have several comments. Number one, I think you're doing, the school system is in good hands. I really do. You're doing you. a You've good job. But also you have that in red of those schools where are overcrowded. I know you do have schools that are undercrowded. And I would like for those also to be brought forth. And to me, there's no excuse in that. When I taught school, we have students that are rising, riding right now on the buses, 20 miles, go to Beaufort County, having to ride all the way to North Pitt, go to Penny Hill, go to Canada. Those students are ride, riding 20 miles or more on the bus. So if, they are, if those students there are riding, why can't other students ride to take and to fill the, the school buildings that we have that are not that are not full? Of course, I know the answer to it, but uh, I'm still bringing it out. Okay. And uh, the next thing, of course, too, you know, I taught school a long time ago. Fifty years ago, Pitt Community College, I was an ag teacher. They came to Belvoir Falcon School. They taught a short course on welding. 
in that school. They taught the in people income, filling out income taxes. They did all of these things through Pitt Community College, working with the Board of Education. It, we got away from that some kind of way, but you're going back to it now. I think that's wonderful. I really do. It's the way that we can utilize and reach these people, teach them something about trades is what they really do need. They really do. And I, what I'm talking, I want to say this to you too. When I went to North Pitt back in the 70s, we, trade schools that we had there, we had about seven. We had full-time brick laying, full-time auto mechanics, full, all of these people, carpentry and everything, they had full-time teachers teaching those courses. <coughs> Ag, all of them. I taught uh, uh, sheet metal work there. So I know, but we got away from it, and I think that's where we missed the boat sometimes. We're not training students to use their hands and to really get out there and do the job. But uh, in close, I do want to say, I appreciate all you do. I know what a hard job teachers have now. Believe me, I do. Because I've got people that I know very well that are involved in education. And of course, I go to the schools a lot too. But thank you so much to all of you, Rock. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linker and, and your staff. If there's no other questions uh, yes. from the board, oh, excuse me. Uh, I, oh, wait, I, wait, I, I one ahead of you, Dr. Johnson. Right. Melvin. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Lincoln, I want to tell you how proud I am to see the, the school system moving forward. Um, I, I read a recent announcement in the paper that the dropout rate has been uh, uh, tremendously improved for Pitt County. I wanted to know what, did, what do you attribute that to? Uh, and secondly, I, I've also read some interesting information in terms of bullying and that we are doing some proactive things in, in, in dealing with that problem. But now it's taken to another level, cyberbullying. And uh, what are we doing, if anything, to deal with that cyberbullying and, 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 and that kind of thing? A lot of it is, uh, specifically talking about cyberbullying, most of it is awareness. Um, I know we have uh, parent information nights at our PTOs and, and, and through Title I plans, the Title I uh, program, just to get parents involved and know what, what's out there. Uh, but a lot of it is just you've got to be aware of where your kids are, whether you're the principal or the teacher or the parent. You know, what are the kids involved with? What are they doing online? You know, um, you know I'm, I'm logged into all of my kids' stuff. So they do something, I know exactly what they're doing, and I can see it, you know. So that's, that's the biggest thing we need is really to keep track of that and have all of our parents get involved in supporting their kids and monitoring their kids. Um, then, of course, one thing it does come to attention, then we need to, of course, uh, react appropriately. And we have counselors and who are trained to deal with those sort of things and get people <coughs> communicating together. Dr. Johnson, then Mr. Garris. Yes, uh, Mr. James would expect me to say this. Uh, we still have Legislative Day in the General Assembly, Mr. James, and uh, although you, I've heard you say you don't think they listen to you, but I, I believe that they, they will listen to you, and it, it will be beneficial if you go with us to Raleigh. Thank right. you. Mr. Gash. Uh, the uh, dual language immersion program. Yes, sir. I think that it is very important that our kids be bilingual. So is the objective of this program to teach our kids to be bilingual, or is it to assist those students that have a problem with English? Both. both. Okay. It's both. It will go both ways. It's going to be at Belleville. It's going to start at Belleville. I would, and you're going to expect. I would expect, and again, this would be demand and everything else, but you know, just from the research around <laughs> other school systems we've looked at, that you know, this is going to be a, a program that, kids, that parents want their kids in that this program would expand past Belvoir to other schools in the county. Um, you know, we can go visit classes or school systems around us that have a couple classes. You know, we're starting off with two classes, but, you know, two classes for uh, 24,000 kids is not a lot. So we would expect that to expand the year after or the following after that. Thank you. Mr. James. I, I want to say one more thing. I think this is what you need to do more of. Let the people know the good things that's going on in the schools in Pitt County. It's a public relation thing. It is very, very important. I didn't read it all, but I looked through the pictures and they're very good. <laughs> That's all I got to say, but it is, it is Thank really. Thank you, Dr. Lanka. 
Thank you, Chairman. Staff. Thank you, County Commissioner. What you do. You. Have a good day, uh, Mr. Manager. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Next, we have an update from um, Mitch Smith, our Corporate Extension Director, on the agency, <coughs> his agency. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. During this meeting, I just want to take a few moments and to mention the process currently underway to restructure the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Our organization has been about a process to secure input from the people of North Carolina through a series of 14 workshops held statewide. The purpose of this visiting process has been for 2,000 of our key stakeholders to tell us what they value the most in our educational program. 160 online comments have been collected to accomplish this, and I serve on a statewide committee to accomplish this goal. I'm here to report today that no decision has been made, but there have been some common themes that have surfaced as a result of this process. These include a strong commitment to production agriculture, leadership development through our 4-H program, families, and food. <clears throat> a very important theme that we have heard about has been the importance of our county partner like Pitt County government. Our state director, Dr. Joe Zablina, intends to unveil a new extension service when we celebrate our centennial in mid-May. <clears throat> After that, counties will be invited to phase in a new structure which will be implemented over a two-year period. So my word to you is stay tuned as we start a new centennial of service as Cooperative Extension. In closing, the Pitt County Extension Center has just completed a cycle of <coughs> winter meetings for 2014 with more than 400 farmers participating. Our county 4-Hers competed in District Activity Day on March the 15th with all receiving medals, seven gold, three silver, and one bronze. We're proud of that. And lastly, um, most recently, our county beekeepers, the Tar River beekeepers, are hoping to build a bee yard at the Ag Center to educate the public of the importance of proper bee management. <coughs> and this is an exciting project and a good thing, and I just want to bring that update to you today. Thank you, Mitch. We receive this as information only. Dr. Johnson, you got a question? Now, I just want to make a comment to one of Mr. Smith's predecessors, uh, Ed Yancey, uh, is in the same church with me every Sunday morning, and uh, he uh, he helped to get a lot of programs started, uh, and and then left Pitt County and went on the state level. But uh, I I uh, talk with him occasionally and. Uh, He's, he still stays up to date with what you folks are doing. He's a fine gentleman. He really is. Mr. Gass. I had one question. Whenever I hear a program that is funded outside of Pitt County and someone comes to us and say, wait and see what's coming, there are going to be some changes, do you anticipate that some of those changes are going to be pushing some of the funding down to the county? Well, I haven't really seen anything concrete. I, I guess my response um, is that um, our cuts over the past 20 years have been about $19 million, and we simply don't have enough funding at the state level to fund the current employee base. So I believe the trend will be more of an area focus. Um, I believe that county government, um, your input will be highly valued in terms of what you're willing to pay for, and I feel good about that. But um, if you're worried about the integrity of the funding relationship you have with NC State, no, sir, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. All Thank counties you. have expressed concern about that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. All right, Mr. James. Uh, on the beekeepers, which I'm very much in interested in, Mitch, I would like to see that brought back. You, we were talking about $1,200, I believe, for that, to have a demonstration plot out there. Have you picked out the site that you want? Yes, sir, I didn't bring a map, but it's going uh, to be. All right, but let me, in case you not don't know what's going on, 
Bees, there are very few colonists now. Bees are very important for farmers in Pitt County or everywhere for pollination. If you know anything <coughs> about plants, you know that to be true. And people are renting now, all people just about who grow cucumbers are renting many different colonists and bring that and place them around our field so that, that those, those <coughs> cucumbers can be produced. And it's a good thing and it will cost Pitt County, you might say, hard than nothing. So you kind of keep that in mind. I'm not talking about thousands, I'm talking about a few hundred. And they are working with Mitch so that he will get the right spot that, that it would be good for students to look at. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Thank Thank you for that. I would mention that this bee yard is um, provided solely um, with no uh, county funding. Uh, Tar River Beekeepers that's right. They'll be do building it all. that. So that's a win-win, I mean, win, Mr. James. It's right. good. All right, Dr. Johnson, then Ms. Ward. Yeah, yes, I, I, uh, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, there's no other member of this board more informed about agriculture than Mr. James, and uh, you keep us informed, and I, for one, appreciate that. Ms. Ward? I just wanted to ask Mitch if he, <coughs> I read an article in the uh, Reflector, um, I think it was this weekend, I'm not sure, about the percentage, which I thought was very high, and we've heard statistics from you all about the um, agricultural community and how we rely on it and the number of people that are, you know, working in it and the need <coughs> for it in this state. I don't know if anyone else read it or remember the percentage, but it was very high, and we are still focusing on agriculture, the people, whether they're involved in it or not, and the people who are involved in it. And I just think that sometimes citizens don't realize that, even though we're kind of going away and becoming more urban, it is still a large part of the state of North Carolina. Thank you Another very much, our number one industry. That Beth mm -hmm. was alluding to, you know, that same article or one related the revenues from it is still astronomical. Exactly. It's number one, I think, isn't it? As far as the income and the yes, business and that It sort represents of thing. more than $150 <coughs> million dollars each year to this county, and we can consistently are a top 20 county in North Carolina. So each farm is a small business. Exactly. Really Thank you. Thank, Thank you so Beth. much. If there's no further questions from Beth, uh, do you have more questions? Um, Mitch, if not, we thank you, Mitch. Uh, Mr. Late. Manager, I believe you're next. <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, Board Member, a few items on the manager's report. Your next meeting dates April 21st and May 5th, respectively, 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. Um, item B, I just want to make you kind of provide you a, a brief update regarding um, um, our outsourcing efforts. The last one we did was the outsourcing of HVAC. I'm going to be having um, Piedmont Service Group come before you in the near future to give a comprehensive report as to what their efforts have done for our buildings in terms of reduction in utility costs. That's coupled with, obviously, our guaranteed energy savings project as well. We've had some real good success with that um, outsourcing effort. Um, look, also, um, in terms of outsourcing, we've been informally discussing among staff the idea of maybe outsourcing part of animal control, maybe the, the adoption part, but we'll, all that is, is continuing to um, be debated and, and, and tossed around at the same time. One last component on, on outsourcing. I'm looking at seeing if there's any opportunities to outsource some or all of our mowing um, as a part of the operation within buildings and grounds, and that would come back to you as, as we get some cost figures on that. We've already done a, a little bit of um, work on this at the district park to see what it would cost to um, hire an outside group to do the mowing there, but we're looking at the um, expanding that to maybe <coughs> all of our facilities. Just want to bring that to your attention. The last thing I had was that's not on the agenda. Have a good news item for um, solid waste and recycling. Pitt County government was selected for an award. It's called the 2014 Local Government Award for from the Carolina Recycling Association. And we received this Friday, and I told our director John Demery I would announce that to you. That's all I have. Thank you. Do we have a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. <coughs> okay. Now, Mr. Manager. Next item under items for discussion, the canine control ordinance, and we have um, Michelle <coughs> Bailey is going to come up and make some introductory comments and brief the board on this. We also have then, I believe, Lisa Overton 
is going to come up and talk about the ordinance language and Dwayne Holder about the budget implications. Good morning. Good morning. Standing here before you today as a follow-up, uh, you had asked that the Animal Control Advisory Board look over the proposed ordinance. They had a quite lengthy and thorough discussion of the ordinance. They recommended five minor changes to the ordinance, um, which legal will go over those um, points in detail. We also discussed the budget, which I think is a um, very important piece to the enforcement of this ordinance. Um, to do it right and for it to be enforceable, we have to commit to the resources, um, both addressing shelter staff and spacing, um, sheltering space. So I ask, um, the Animal Control Board asks that you look at those two pieces together. We are still researching licensing and revenue. I think we're finding there's a lot more to it. We want to be thorough in that report, and the Animal Control Board is having a specially called meeting this Thursday to discuss that more in detail, and we'll be bringing that back as part of budget workshop. Um, and other than that, if you have any specific questions after um, the county attorney and Dwayne present the budget piece, I'll be glad to answer them to the best of my ability. What's the feeling of the board? We've got several uh, informational speakers. Do you want to get them as you go, or you want to let's get all the information first? Half a question, Mr. James. Go ahead. Uh, Beth, these five things that they're talking about, uh, <coughs> are they included in your ordinance? It is. So it would be safe to go. But okay. I have no other questions. Thank you. Now, who's we the next presenter? I believe it'll be Janice Gallagher. Yes. Yeah, and okay. I'll cover that for Lisa. There were just five minor changes, um, and, and I would like to acknowledge Lisa Overton's efforts in this process as well. She is assigned to the Animal Control Advisory Board within my office um, and is very familiar with these and has worked diligently with the board and staff to help prepare um, this ordinance and, and also working with Ms. Sanchez and, and all of the other uh, stakeholders involved. Um, so you have before you in your uh, agenda package the ordinance with the changes tracked. Um, and so you can see what they are. I don't want to overly belabor the point, but I'll just mention that what we've done, one of the first changes was in Section 2, wherein the definition of property was revised to include where an owner is with permission. Um, so we've expanded that definition. Um, and you heard that in public comments the last time, and those were now incorporated into this ordinance. Under Section 2 in definitions, we have revised the definition of restraint to include actual restraint. That will address the concern that you've heard the public addresses about a dog on a leash that's running with no owner on the other end of it. Um, so there's actual restraint now included. There has to be a person at the other end of that leash. Um, in Section 4, there was some concern expressed. Um, with regard to the exclusion for hunting dogs. And to make that absolutely clear, we, were, we clarified um, that you must have an active hunting license if you're hunting your dogs um, before that roaming dog is considered a hunting dog. Uh, under Section 7 was the fourth change that we made with regard to redemption. And because we realized that this may increase the number of dogs that will be um, impounded at the shelter, we increased the typical 72-hour wait time <coughs> to five days, or the equivalent of 120 hours is what we've included in the ordinance, um, to allow some additional time for lost dogs to be reunited with their owners in this process. And then the last change um, was more uh, clerical to change reference to animal to specifically reference dog. This is only talking about dogs. We're not talking about <coughs> other counties um, who have control ordinances, include cats, includes ferrets, includes other things like that. Um, Pitt County's ordinance at this time is specific only to dogs, and so we changed animal to dog. Um, with that, you have the ordinance in front of you, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Any other presenters? <coughs> I believe. Blaine? Blaine. Yes, sir. Uh, also included in your packet on page 66, uh, staff has prepared some preliminary projections on the cost of enforcement of the proposed canine uh, containment uh, or control ordinance. Uh, one of the things that our county attorney pointed out was uh, a uh, projected increase in the number of uh, dogs that would be housed along with that the ordinance also proposes a longer holding period uh, from 72 hours to, I think, 120. So in our projections, we are looking at an additional uh, 6,000 square feet 
uh, square foot facility that would be needed to accommodate the increased uh, number of dogs as well as the longer holding period. <clears throat> You'll see in the proposed budget, we've given you a projection on what the uh, increase would entail. Again, this is preliminary, uh, as well as uh, the proposed increase in staffing. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out, or a couple of things that I'll point out, uh, this, the increase in staffing does include, if you re recall, the Animal Control Advisory Board did request 3.5 FTEs to bring the shelter into compliance just with standards as they are today. So I would say that while the five FTEs represents the current staffing, remember that your advisory board has requested an additional 3.5. Um, so that is included in the 19.5 uh, increase. And what we did is we pulled out how much general fund is currently subsidizing animal control operations. Today, uh, the general fund is subsidizing to the tune of $339,049. And in the proposed uh, budget, it would subsidize $953,681. The proposed budget does include a preliminary projection of both citation fees that would come about as the result of enforcement of the ordinance. If you look in the ordinance, there are certain citations that uh, are handed out to offenders. It also includes a preliminary uh, projection of licensing fees. Uh, uh, just in the uh, rural or, or um, unincorporated areas. Those both uh, are currently in the budget to the tune of uh, approximately $260,000 combined. Uh, as uh, Ms. Whaley pointed out, we are refining those numbers and doing uh, a little more look at some of the jurisdictions that currently have these regulations in place, and we feel like we'll have some better numbers. Uh, we have recently engaged uh, the services uh, for a very nominal fee. There's an industry leader in shelter planning, uh, shelterplanners.com uh, consultants that are doing an initial sizing study of the shelter as well. And I will say that their preliminary projections uh, are that we would need, uh, I think, anywhere from 13 to 18,000 square feet. That is in the neighborhood of what we uh, initially project here in needing an additional 6,000 square feet. I think the shelter is currently about 7,300 square feet currently. Um, so with that, also, I've heard some discussion about this funding uh, not just uh, representing what would be needed to enforce the ordinance. Um, wh what we are taking into a, making an assumption in this budget is that all of the current functions that are being provided at the shelter will continue. And because of the increase in the dogs, that they will continue at an increased uh, rate. And I'm talking about things like outreach to the public, public education, adoptions, all of those additional uh, services that are outside of just enforcement are included, and this budget does allow for proper staffing for all of the functions. Do we have any other presenters if, if, from the county? If not, I want to ask the county manager to uh, bring his, his recommendation of what he has critiqued from this, uh, Mr. Manager. Well, I just want to make one comment first, and that um, from what Dwayne had presented on the proposed budget, that's for the year one. But as you look at year two and going out, the one-time <coughs> the one-time startup cost of one hundred thirty thousand dollars would not have to be budgeted year two, three, and four. So that 953,000 as it stands today would drop to 824,000 as you, once we incur those year one startup costs. Um, my recommendation on this as provided in your um, agenda abstract was basically to hear and receive the recommendation of the Animal Control Advisory Board as presented by staff in both the ordinance content and in the, the budget content. The um, Animal Control Advisory Board is meeting this week again on the 10th they will be getting their arms more around the um, um, fee, in, the, the proposed fee increases they're going to recommend to you, whether that's a, a fee along with the, the rabies tag, whether it's a, a, a tax, whether it's a whatever it may be, that's still coming back and being refined. Like Dwayne said, there are some preliminary numbers that have been interjected into this um, at this point in time. So my recommendation is to, um, to receive what's been done so far 
I'm recommending not to act on the ordinance until um, you hear and see the entire budget picture for the, the entire county. Um, your last meeting, I alluded to the fact that we have about 1% or less growth in revenues, and about 9 to 10% in additional increases in funding. To equate that to dollars, you know, the general fund budget is about a $100 million budget, plus or minus, well, plus, and so we have about a million or less in increased revenues, and about $10 million in needs or requests being asked for by departments. That, that $1 million right now would hardly even do a cost of living to our employees let alone any other expansion um, within the organization for whether it's utilities, gas, the natural increases we would expect. So that's why I'm really concerned that you as a board know the total budget picture. Yes, this would be one of your top priorities, but make sure that you align this with your other top priorities to see how to um, divvy up funding uh, as such. Ms. Waller? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion and just kind of put that out if we want any more discussion, but I've written it down, so I'm going to try to read it. <coughs> um, I first want to thank the two groups and our people uh, here at the county office for coming together and proceeding forward. It sounds to me like the ordinance encompasses everything. And I think there are a lot of things that need to be looked at, maybe a, a year to year, bringing on different things that might make a difference. But my motion is uh, I move to accept the recommendations <coughs> of the Animal Control Advisory Board uh, to date and refer back to this board to refine the fees recommendation um, item, and that should come back at the board's uh, budget workshops. Um, I'd also like to add that a public hearing, which we usually do for all ordinances, should be held after the adoption of the um, ordinance. After Is that before. After, did I say before? No. I meant before. Before. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. Right. Meant after the meeting when you came up with the ordinance, final ordinance. We have Thank a you. motion. Is there a second to that? <clears throat> I second the motion, but may I talk Have a discussion, bit? yes, sir. I believe two key important things that has to be in there is that the Sheriff's Department has got to be involved. Mm -hmm. There is no ifs and ands about it. I believe that those three and a half employees, additional ones, Two of those should be full-time in the Sheriff's Department, but at the same time, go with be there for the animal control. And once we get it started, you're going to find that things that you're not going to need everything you think you're going to need now. You really let them know you mean business. It is very important. And I, I, the next thing that needs to be in there Every animal that goes before in that shelter ought to be tagged with the chip who owns that animal. I don't care what you say. If a dog is out there and he bites somebody, he's not going to take and claim that dog under normal conditions. I don't think I would. And so I think they need to be labeled when they come in that shelter and if they don't have the money, well, if they, they can do that. People have spent hundreds and thousands of dollars on dogs. Let's face it. And I, those, <clears throat> but I support it 100%. It's got to be done. We've got to prevent these dogs from biting people, and, and we've got to control the population of dogs. There's no ifs and ands about it. And that's the only way we're going to do it. And, and I'm for the motion but i think we got to have put teeth in that thing where it can be enforced thank you mr james ms ward um one other thing beside and i think it's a great idea to think about you know involving the sheriff de sheriff's department it. certainly in this planning and uh tweaking the ordinance until before <coughs> they bring it back to us but i think i'd, I'd like to add that we make sure that we consider the local nonprofits who have offered 
to help us with the adoption oh, yeah. and getting the animals back to the people they belong to. And they have all shown support for that. So I want that to be considered before you come back, you know, with the next ordinance. Thank you. Well, Jimmy. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I want to make sure I understood the motion. Is the motion to approve the ordinance or no, accept no, the no, ordinance? No, 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 no. Accept the ordinance. To Very accept good. it and send it and okay. back through the process. Very and good. these yes. two things that yes. were mentioned I, were I, just to make sure we consider those two. Yes. Very good. I support that because we really need to understand the funding of our whole budget cycle. If we just look at this one item under the current dollars and the proposed dollars, that's an additional $614,000 from our general fund. That is almost a penny on our tax rate. So I, I think the ordinance is excellent. Uh, those who have worked on it has done an excellent job, but we need to understand the total cost impact of our budget. We're going to have another presentation later on in our meeting today where someone's going to be asking for 12 employees and then that goes up to about 31 next year and next year cycle. And we haven't heard from the sheriff yet. We know that he's going to be requesting an increase. So we need to see the whole package and then see what we can do. And was suggested by one uh, uh, citizen at our public address, you know, maybe we need to to phase into some of these programs, but at least start them and approve uh, on this on this one, uh, maybe approve the ordinance and then phase in pieces of it rather than try to swallow the whole thing at one shot. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I think it's very important that, that we certainly uh, uh, abide by the recommendation that uh, Commissioner Ward made, but I also think that it's, it's crucial that we don't forget uh, the outcry of the community. <coughs> this is a, a very serious uh, condition with, our, with the dogs of Pitt County and that we, that we, we act on this as prudent as possible. Uh, Scott, our manager, talked about the uh, possible saving of one thousand dollars, I think, uh, through outsourcing. And, um, and, and, and this is uh, my understanding through uh, uh, an, an agency to ha handle the adoption. And, and so I, I think that when you look at these terms and in and, and terms of trying to save money, and we are moving in the right direction in terms of trying to um, uh, utilize the funds appropriately for the county. But uh, again, I don't want to see that this is sort of put in a back burner because the public has really outcried uh, on this concern and we need to uh, try to do as much as possible to to deal with this um, tremendous problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I read through it, you know, one of the things that we know that causes dog bites is uh, aggressive animals, and a lot of animals become aggressive because of inhumane treatment. Why wasn't tethering addressed in the ordinance? And, and I'm talking about permanent tethering. I'm not talking about at a hunting camp where you tether the dogs for a little while or you let a dog out to use the bathroom. I'm talking about people that permanently tether those dogs who eventually do damage to themselves or someone else or break free or, or get away and, and become aggressive. Not to speak for the total animal control advisory board, but to be honest, I think the meeting was four hours long going through the ordinance as is. There was some discussions about tethering, but it didn't get to finish and go into detail because that's just another whole issue that requires a lot more time and thought, and we do have people with different opinions on it. Um, I know it is the desire of some of the board members to pursue it further. Um, at this point, we felt like they were tasked into getting this back to you as quickly as possible, and we have had some discussions about perhaps it would fit under the neglect and cruelty ordinance, and maybe that could be re-looked at, and would it be appropriate to go there, or should it be included with this? But we didn't want to slow down the recommendations coming back to you for this particular ordinance. Okay, that's good. I, I would just hate that the only time we consider how humanely animals are treated is when Mr. we're putting them down. Mr. Chairman. Right. Dad, wait, that's wait, the, wait, Gene. Let's let's let this one finish here, Mr. Okay. Webb. I'm and done. This is on this. All right, now, Mr. James. D on that, you don't want to mess with that. There's too many people in rural Pitt County. The only way they can have a dog is to own that leech. I had a man to come to me. He said, Mr. James, please don't go that way. 
So I'm telling you, leave things like that alone. Don't start meddling with it. Do you got problems? We need to prevent these dogs. Oh, sure, they're going to break loose once in a while. Sure, they're going to break out the house once in a while, too. Remember that. And that person's going to get fined that that you're talking about. Well, so yeah, let them easier. get fine if they it get would, loose from that loose. It's easier fine. for them just to right. engage in the ordinance as it is and, and, and do something more humane with the dog because the dog's going to be more Don't worry about the humane. That, that, to them, they're taking care well, of that dog. Well, you can't have everything just the way you want it. Oh, well, I don't want it that that's way. That's 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 but I'm telling you how the people feel. And I'm representing my people. Right. And they don't want they want you to have that right. Can we just add that for discussion later with your board, Michelle? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? If not, let's vote on <coughs> All right, Eugene and Dave. Yep, Dave, I know Gene. <coughs> have we got? Have we done it? Yes, sir. Now let's move on to the next order of business, uh, Mr. Manager. Yes, next order of business under items for discussion number one is a request from our interim DSS director Earl Merritt. If you'll come forward to discuss um, requests for income maintenance staff positions in the current fiscal year. <coughs> yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're asking to for um, 12 permanent positions this fiscal year to pay for it this fiscal year out of lap salary funds. Um, the actual cost to the county would be between uh, $29,000 and $58,000 in matching funds. Medicaid match um, working in NC FAST to $75,25. We have worked with um, Department of Commerce, Division of Workforce Solutions to get uh, Workforce Investment Act grants to fund them. Um, and then others would be 50-50. We have um, <coughs> increased about 5,000 cases in food and nutrition, and we're serving about 46,000 people in Medicaid in Pitt County. Well, Mr. James? Uh, you know, I'm on the Social Service Board, and we're coming out much better than I thought we were going to come out. Of course, it's not good. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Any time. But I appreciate all that you all are doing. <clears throat> And I move, Mr. Chairman, that we approve the recommendation that our director, acting director, has presented uh, towards uh, helping them solve the problem in social services on the fast fire, I suppose. Is that what you kind of want? Yes, sir. It, uh, it, it needs to be done. Uh, uh, let's, let's, is, is that what the manager's recommended? Well, actually, what, let me just make a comment if I can. The, the cost that Mr. Meritor is referring to would be the cost for the last quarter of this fiscal year, so that... Twenty-nine thousand and fifty-eight. The twenty-nine thousand is, is we if we get a fifty percent reimbursement. Actually, the fifty-eight thousand if we get a fifty percent reimbursement. The twenty-nine thousand if we get a seventy-five percent reimbursement. <coughs> Just need to keep in mind that if you approve the twelve positions, these twelve people would still be here July one. This will affect the new budget. So the numbers he's take he's referring to you have to times by four as you move into the new fiscal year because they'll have a four quarters of the year. So you're looking at between one hundred sixteen thousand to two hundred thirty-two thousand of July one impact in the new year's budget. So you're really you're using 25% of your growth in the base at a worst case scenario on the, the, the cost sharing with the feds on these 12 positions. I'm not saying they're not needed, but I'm just saying just realize this is kind of like animal control. You're making a decision without seeing the whole budget picture in front of you. That you're all, you're really committing to. Wait, Mr. One. James, Tom, then Beth, and then Mr. James. I was not here during the depth of the, the recession. Uh, I know that several positions, in fact, I heard as many as 20 were cut from social services at that time. Did the county's money that they give to social services, which is almost $9 million now, did that drop? Yes, it dropped in, in accordance with the, the funding <coughs> like we're talking about here, the 50% match. It, that 50%, that's why we deleted the vacant positions to save money on the general fund. Yeah. That was the only reason, basically. All right, well, that's, I have no other questions. Uh, had you finished, Tom? Yes, I'm finished. Beth, okay. Mr. James. Did, if we did not, if we get a second, then I would like to make a, a re, um, 
I want to say a replacement, substitute. a substitute motion. Thank you very much. Same thing, uh, meaning. Well, let's, um, let's verify where you had an if there. Did we get a second, Madam Clerk? So we then did not I can have a make second. a new motion, please. Well, that's up to y'all. Okay, I'd like to make a motion at this time <coughs> that um, we, the amount is about fifty thousand dollars. Is that what you're saying? If we budget and just what I want to do is make a motion that we give the fifty thousand dollars, which will carry whatever choice you take as far as who you're going to hire whether it's 24 half-time people, 12 half-time people, or whatever, but for it to only go through July 1. Mm. And then we will study the budget that you'll bring to us at the budget workshop to make a decision for year 24-15. That's my motion. All right, is there a second to that? What's the difference in that and the motion I made? Mine was going to July 1st. I think what not included in your motion. Well, oh, well, that's what if I understand Ms. Ward's motion, if I, if I yes, may, I think please. she's saying use these dollars for outsourcing, like through Vanguard, like the last meeting you had, you had a forty or forty thousand dollar budget amendment that allowed DSS to use your part time or even full time, but these would not be full time equivalents on the county's um, personnel payroll. Sorry. That would, if if you do as Mr. Merritt is asking today, you've got twelve people. If you decide you don't want, you're not going to carry them July one, then basically you have to do a reduction in force. And they would have to to leave if they're basically what I'm saying. Do, do we, wait a minute, let's get straight. Do we have a second for the motion? Yeah. What? Oh, you want a second on yeah, motion? I'll second you? that All motion. Right. Second on motion. Now for discussion, and we've got Mr. James, and then Glenn, and then Melvin, and Earl, then Mr. Garish. Earl, explain to us uh, <coughs> the way that you did about it to me, starting next year in the budget. How would that affect the budget as far as budget money is concerned, like you did to me? Well, if we approve, if you approve um, permanent positions, then they would carry over as the man <laughs> said next year. Yeah. We're trying to work with Pitt Community College and the Division of Commerce um, Workforce Solutions to get a course going at Pitt Community College to identify people um, who can do this job and to do preliminary training and then move them over into the positions. Um, if we outsource, our experience has been that they are not as productive as our workers and our workers have had to go back behind them and, and um, proof their work and make corrections in it. Now, if we do not do that, what, could, what will the results be on the U.S.? I don't think we will even come close to getting the work done. Part of this course too would give us um, workers to train and move into vacancies as they come and have people at a different level of training and a different level of productivity. And so they would be more productive um, if, we, if we go to, with the measure that I have recommended. All right, we discussed this side, Mr. Webb. Um, didn't, what about the state employees that were assigned to work there? There were three state employees. We have two now, and we have them actually working on caseloads. Are they, was there some that were sent home Friday? And I met with them. No, they were not sent home. Okay. When you um, the there, there was some discussion about that. We met with the state, and they redefined what they could do for us, okay. and they don't have a lot of training, so we're having to train them to actually do the work. But they, um, they will possibly leave in the end of June okay. because and, of a lack of funding. And the ones that we're going to hire, will they have training? Yes, they will go through Pitt Community College. Mm -hmm. They will be profiled. They will get uh, some training through them, and then we will further train them when we get them. How long will all that take? <coughs> Generally, it takes um, two to three months for them to start being productive. And this is just to set this course up, so we really won't, it really won't be this much because um, the community college is putting that together and doing the profiling and everything. So it'll be later on this month or the first of May before they can start the course. So even if we approve this, by the time they're even productive, we'll be firing them again. Um, so this it, will, it, this it, will it, have it, a net no effect then at no, all that's, in that's what right. we're doing. That's right. Unless that's we're willing to commit to the whole that's, 40. That's right. So well, I, it, 
even if you commit to 12, that's that much more pro productivity. But remember, we've done productivity studies, and we cannot do the work with the people that we have. It, it can't, it, it's not possible. But if we can't afford the new people, and we're just going to let them go July 1, and they're not even going to be productive before July 1, then what we're approving, if we approve this today, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to be an exercise I agree. and a waste of $50,000 or however much it was going to cost to July. You know, we could, we could do some work with, um, with the temporary agency. Um, it's more expensive, um, and we do get some productivity out of them. But as I said, it puts more work on the existing staff, too, to proof it and make sure the work's done correctly. But either way, it doesn't, it, nothing changes, though, is what I'm saying. It just doesn't seem like anything changes. We can't get productivity out of the employee until we're about ready to let them go because we haven't seen the full. You're correct. And so, and let, so let's say we approve and we spend this money today, and then next month in our budget meeting we decide that we can expand because we have this animal control issue and we have the, the issues with the sheriff and we've got that minute growth, uh, then we really just blown $50,000. Yes, sir. But and, and wasted a lot of people's time. I mean, as far and giving them false hope of a, a permanent position. Well, we would we have some vacancies and we do have turnover, so we could continue some people on. But you're correct, basically. But I keep reminding you, the work will not get done. I understand. <laughs> but at, at the same time, we we've got a lot of departments that provide services to people, taxpayers that need services as well, and 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 this is something that. I mean, it's bad. It's not. It's not a great situation. But at the same time, I just don't see where we have the room to expand. And if nothing's going to happen, I don't see a point in voting for this because I, there's just no point in exercising a, a waste of fifty thousand dollars if we don't know that we can fully fund it and get it going in the right direction. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Melvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I don't understand what 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 you're saying. If we fund this, these positions until the June 30th, uh, as the manager uh, uh, suggested, and you're saying that you don't see any productivity that we can get from that? I mean, yeah. I've, I've yeah. had a lot of people, excuse me, uh, that has called and, and they want to, they want to quite frankly eat. And certainly I'm for uh, helping those individuals uh, citizens in Pitt County that can't eat, that are eligible to eat, to eat. Now, the proposal, the, 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 the plan of action, as I understand it, is to provide you some people until June 30th <coughs> to work on that situation to help these individuals. And you're telling me if I, if I and that's why I'm, I'm confused, that even if we do that to June 30th, it's, it's, it's not going to work. If we add new people, additional people, it will take a while to train them. We can get some productivity out of a temporary agency um, as far as getting food and medical benefits to people, but we can't get sufficient amount of assistance from them to cover the whole case, <coughs> the, the, the deficit that we have in process in the cases. Yeah, okay, thank you. I want the manager, uh, if you can speak to that, because this, this is concerning me, this is concerning me great, greatly, because again, I, it bothers me to see people hungry when they're eligible to eat. And he, and he, and, and, and Ms. Mayor is saying that uh, it's not gonna work. Well, I think, I think first of all, I wanna clarify the, um, the issue on the food stamps or, or food, that has been resolved, their caseload is, is, is up to date for the most part. What they're, the obstacle they're facing now is the Medicaid caseload in terms of folks needing um, their Medicaid cases processed so they can, can uh, get the proper medical treatment. So that's, we've gone from want from eating to, to medical in terms of the, the, the crisis. I guess my, my question to Mr. Merritt would be, Pitt County is not unique in our situation compared to the other 99 counties across North Carolina. What sanctions do you think may be imposed on either individual counties or the state as a whole if everybody continues to have this backlog that not only Pitt is in, but I believe almost every county in North Carolina is somewhat similar to Pitt. Wouldn't, or can you address that? Um, 
the, with food and nutrition, they've um, threatened the federal match for the administration of the programs. I have not been given any information as far as Medicaid is concerned. Right, and on the food and nutrition, the state of North Carolina and all 100 counties successfully met the, the threat. I mean, we didn't the have March to have the March 31st, post. the oh. March 31st deadline, yes. <coughs> <coughs> all right, uh, let's see. Can't you finish, Melvin? I'm finished. Mr. Gash? Uh, if I understand the motion correctly, I am uh, willing to support that motion because if the worst case scenario, we are still not committing those dollars to the 2014-15 budget because these would be temporary contract employees. But if we go that route, and the other thing is the money to cover those temporary employees is already in your budget for yes. this year. Yes, sir. Okay. But my, my concern now after the discussion is I want to make sure that if we go that route, and I know that's not your preferred route, that those people will be able to assist us with this backlog. I think they will help, but I don't think it will be sufficient to, to Okay, cover. it's not, it will help, but not be sufficient. Will the help be enough that it would be wise for us to spend this dollar, these dollars it, on it? It, it would be better than not having anything okay, at all. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, let's see, Mr. James and then Mr. Johnson. You all to me are missing the boat. What he wants to sit, you got Pitt Community College, are going to train our employees to do a better job, a faster job. Am I not correct? Yes, sir. That right now, they don't know, they, they, if you put me in there, I'm not used to all those computers working them and everything. If they go there, they're going to be get this training that they can come back and probably do, instead of doing 20 cases, they can do 30 cases. And you, it's not going to stop on uh, uh, July 1st. Let me tell you, Medicaid is more important than the food. You let these elderly people out there and they got nowhere to go <coughs> to a doctor, then you we're in trouble. Or well, I'm in trouble because I'm going to feel guilty about it. And I haven't done what I ought to have done. And so I, I think that we have no choice but to go ahead and work with Pitt Community College, train these workers to take it to be able to do the job. And I'm not talking about it. I got enough sense to know we're gonna, not going to terminate them if we need them July 1st. And you know that. I got one question. Mr. Garris asked if you could better the situation, for lack of a better term, by the $50,000 that's included in this motion. You said you could, but it wouldn't be proficient. Is that, was that your remark? It wouldn't be sufficient and... Sufficient, not proficient. Yeah. Okay. All right. At the main time that you're getting that 50000 aren't you getting money from the feds and the states to help alleviate our problem? Yes, sir, we get So, so now let me get my, through my question, then I want my answer. What is the total money through this period, through June the 3rd to the 14th, Will you get if you take this 50 and the money's from the feds and the money from the state? We had $115,878. All right, thanks, sir. All right, now we've got a motion. Uh, right, Mr. Chairman, you want to I, talk I, some I, more? Uh, oh, excuse me, Tom. I, I, I missed Tom, Jimmy. Excuse okay. me. Well, th there is <clears throat> still the issue that I, I am troubled with. Back in November, Peggy Quinn, uh, DSS <coughs> fiscal officer. I met with uh, her, uh, Scott, you weren't here, um, Mr. Taylor was, uh, Dwayne was, several other people, uh, with, I, let's say I think Janice was. So there was a number of people there. And <coughs> the letter that she had showed that of the $8,864,519 that we give, could only be accounted as far as mandated funds, funds that we, by state law, under state law, the state and counties must budget and maintain spending at 100% of the fiscal year 1996-97, could only account for three million seven hundred and fifty, I mean 35,150, call it $60. It left $5.1 million that I still question why are we even giving it to you? When we have so many other competing needs, it, now, 
I understand, but the budget that the Department of Social Services has is a lot bigger than our budget. And, and so I'm still questioning that. We have um, a variety of programs. We have income maintenance caseworkers now that are about a 50-50 match. So half of that would be for, would be county funding. With the enhanced funding through Medicaid and whatever, that could go to 75-25 for part of them. We have child support. That's 66 and two thirds and one third county money less the incentive money that they generate. So it's less than one third. We have adult protective services. That is um, paid for primarily with SSBG funds and it's not sufficient. Maybe Ms. Queen can tell me what that ends up, the match ends up being, but generally it's not even 50-50 county. We have child protective services. They're funded with TANF money largely and that's 100% federal money and then some other other funds too. Um, we have prevention, which is Medicaid transportation, work first. Um, work first is paid for with TANF and that's 100%. We have daycare that we get funds from the state, four to 5% uh, of the total expenditure from the state to pay for administration. And um, the rest, the other 23 employees are administration, accounting, and legal. So all of the funds are matching funds to match to draw down state and federal funds to operate the Department of Social Services. And why was it that she could only account for $3,700,000 to my satisfaction that actually is a direct match? I would like for you uh, after this meeting to get a copy of her letter November the 13th, 2013 go through it, I'd really like an explanation as to what, where do the dollars, the dollars that we give from the county actually go? Well, they, they go to those programs I that I I understand that, mentioned. but what is mandated? They're all by mandated state law? programs. I would like to have an, a full enumeration because literally two thirds or close to two thirds of the amount of money, according to this letter, is still in question in my mind. I don't understand it. Didn't understand it then. One of the things, sir, you were doing, if you looked at uh, the paragraphs, you were sort of comparing apples to oranges because in one of the paragraphs I was These are your apples and your oranges. I know, but when you read it, you didn't, you didn't interpret it the way I interpreted it when I was writing it, I guess is the right answer to that. For instance, when I said we had to stay at the 1997 level, 1995 level, that was talking about one program which was, in fact, um, the maintenance of effort for work first. That number hasn't changed. Then I went on and I said something else in that uh, letter about um, Medicaid uh, or food stamps, the 50%. I gave you a million some dollar number. A million nine hundred and forty thousand. It was. We were looking at two different years, and that, and it was only a portion. I was trying to let you see that we get reimbursed, but it was only a portion of the all of the programs that we do. I did not, in that letter, outline every single program that we had. In, in, in subsequent meetings with you, I've tried to explain it to you There by were, every were no program. subsequent meetings. It was that one, that was the last meeting well, we had. Well, and, and that letter was before the meetings and I right. actually showed you the, the, the expenditure, the, um, how much reimbursement we get, how much is federal, state by every <coughs> program. I gave you a list of, of, the, of the programs that we've got and the matching that was required. Um, I but, have but them. I, they're all here, they're all included, but they're not enumerated as far as what the expense is. That's what I was you, trying. You put, you've put down, a, a, you, you're saying that I've twisted these numbers in effect. No, I didn't. I'm using your numbers. No. Yes, I sir. added up the groups that you said were mandated and I'm left with five, a uh, five million one hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollar question. I in no way want to in, to in, to come anywhere near saying that you've twisted the numbers. That's not what I meant at all. What I'm saying is, we were looking in the letter I gave you. I only highlighted a couple of the <coughs> programs from one fiscal year to another. Some of them were one fiscal year and some were another, and you added them together, and that's what you came up with. I did not go through in that letter 
every program that we had. I tried to do that in the next time we met when we actually we had a face-to-face meeting. We didn't have a next time. We that had a face-to-face -face meeting. This, this letter didn't go with the, well, anyway. But if you the meeting sit down that we with, had was because of this letter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we tried to go through. I tried to go through every single thing that you needed to that by by item. But if you would sit down with Mr. Merritt again and myself, I think we can do it one more time. I I just want to make sure that you understand. I'm not saying you twisted our numbers. It's just the way we think. Cost allocation and that kind of thing is a little different from the way you think out with uh, when you buy something a dollar, you spend a dollar you know that you got that dollar from profit or you got it from whatever you got it from. Whereas with us, if we spend a dollar, 75% of it may come from the federal government, 25 from the state and 25 from us. Or well, you'll have to that. excuse me. I'm yeah. just a simple businessman. Yes, and when sir. I see assets and I see expenditures and I see them listed down there, yes, I can understand that. I know. But, but, but when you give me only partial information, it leaves me with a, a big question mark. Yes, I, I, yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman, I really don't want to belabor this meeting any further, but I do have one more question. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, what you really need is you need 12 people or something. I do not. Uh, well, I, what I can't, we need is 31. Well, I know what I'm talking about now. Right. I can't support something that's going to cut off in June the 30th. By the time they finally get them trained, they will have a net loss because they will have people that would otherwise be productive, that are gonna be tied up helping to train these people, so you may end up getting less out of it, not more. And then, so it just doesn't make sense to go for 12 people. I do understand that we cut 20 some positions, and I think the board really needs to look at permanent funding. If we're gonna go with 12 or 14 or 31 or some number, whatever we come up with now, it ought to be long term. It shouldn't be phased out in, in June the 30th. And Anything one other thing, could I have the motion restated because I'm confused as to exactly what it's covering. All right, can you restate the motion? Motion to approve 50,000 for outsourcing the positions through July 1st, 2014. Okay, thank you. Now I believe, had you finished time? Yes, I'm finished time. Now I believe Dr. Johnson and then Ms. Ward. Mr. Chairman, I believe it's time for a break and these folks need to put their heads together and, and make it clear what the motion is supposed to be. Well, let's vote on this and then you can break. Uh, any further, Ms. Yep. Ward? The only other thing I wanted to say was that <clears throat> how many people have been working for us that were, that are, some are being let go, some are staying on, whatever, that we could hire right now with this money. And my, I still say we made a budget decision to wait on the dog ordinance because of the impact of the budget on the budget process that we have got to deal with. I am not hoping that some of the, I hope you have some people that you feel like are temporary now that you could hire in these places. And the statement you made was it would be between one, two, or three months before the community college could train these people that we want to be looking at later. So I think we need to use the people that have been here people from Vanguard or whatever use this $50,000 very wisely between now and when you come before us with the budget, you can report on the success of them. It doesn't mean you're gonna fire them. Include the ones you wanna keep in your recommendation and we'll have a better idea of whether we can fund 12. I don't think we should make that decision now. We've made other decisions to postpone large budget items until the budget workshop. And that's really why I made this motion, not to put you in a situation where you would, on June the 30th, have nobody. I would hope by June the 30th, you'd have 12 good people identified to if that's what you wanna include in your budget, or 20 if that's how many you want to include in your budget. And I'm not asking for a response, I'm just, letting the commissioners know why I made that motion. Thank you. All Mr. Right. Chairman, I got a question of, to Beth, if I could. Oh, yeah. Beth, 
if they're going to an outside agency, what's the chances of us stealing these people? I guess would be the question. Well, or are, my, they, or are they going to stick with that agency? My response to that would be, I think that's up to the people who are here to identify those people. Some, as you stated, I think you said, some have been let go. Uh, with the, and see, I'm thinking, I'm still thinking about NC Fast. This is one of the reasons we're in the position we're in now. I would think maybe some of those people we could look back at, even though they haven't been trained in Medicaid, but they certainly have been working with our computers and moving forward. So anyway, I, don't, I have no idea what those people will respond. Do, do you have anything to add that we haven't talked about on this issue? Do talk. If not, let's vote. Yeah, I'm ready to vote, but NC right. Fast, I want to correct. That's the a best. different matter, Gene. Medicated food, all right. that's all the same ones. Uh, do the same everybody thing understand thing. the motion? No. You ready to vote? Yeah. I'm Thank you. <laughs> all right, you got that? Next order of business, Mr. Manager, is... Uh... Next order of business will be the um, request from Farmville EMS. I think Noli is coming forward on that. For those that have read your information, we've got uh, an oversight committee recommending this budget amendment. What's the pleasure of the group? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, let's vote. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, next. Next, you have a resignation from the Pitt <coughs> County Nursing Home Adult Care Community Advisory Committee. You have it on page 73. Uh, Julia Banks has resigned, and they're requesting that the um, spot be advertised for applicants and then to be considered for a future filling. I so move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. No, all right, let's vote. Next. Next on the Board of Health, you have a reappointment request from the Board of Health for the engineer seat held by Jeffrey Wilson. And they're recommending he be reappointed. Mr. Chairman, I, I move that uh, he be reappointed. Second. So, all right. Um, next on the agenda was the added item from Vice Chairman Webb, and I'll pass some information out on that for the board's pleasure. Please take a copy. Thank you, Mr. Manager. It was suggested to me uh, through this letter from Judge Duke, and we met about it, that uh, that we allow a portrait of our chairman, uh, Mark Owens, be presented and hung in the historical Pitt County Superior Court. Uh, I think we all know Mr. Owens' credentials, and I don't want to embarrass him by reading through everything, but uh, I'd ask for a motion that we approve this request. So move. Second. I second it. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next, Mr. Manager? Um, closed session. Do we have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Second. Attorney, describe for us where yes. we're going. It's been suggested that this board go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143.318.11A5 is the first round to establish or instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning a position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body negotiating the price or material <coughs> terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. Also under subsection A6, which is your personnel ground to consider qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or initial employment of an individual public officer or employee. And thirdly, under subsection A1, to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of the state and of the United States or not considered a public record, and also for under attorney-client privilege as well. All right, we're ready for closed session. Thank you. Mr. <coughs> Tom, Colson, vote. Yes. Sorry. <coughs> Thank you for your patience. We are now back in open session. Uh, Mr. Garrett, do you have something to say to me? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the deed for the collection site from the town of Bethel 
and that we also purchase title insurance for that site. Second. Second, Second that motion. All right, let's vote. Okay, uh, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion that we approve the minutes as to the content only for March 10th and March 24th, 2014 closed sessions. Second. Thank you. Now, the any commissioner's comments? If not, do we have a motion to adjourn? Move adjourn. Second. Let's vote. Thank you. <coughs>